Good evening, everybody. Let's try that again. Good evening, everybody. Um, we are still climbing in numbers, so we'll give it a few more minutes. Okay, we'll get started. Uh, we're holding pretty steady on the numbers, about 140 people right now. Um, I am Frank Hackett, I'm the superintendent of schools, and I have uh, Jim Lee, the assistant superintendent of schools, with me uh, in this panel. Um, tonight, what we wanna do is provide you a brief overview of the reopening plan, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the schedules, um, and uh, we'll also then talk a little bit about just kind of the overall opening. And then we'll try to, we will get to questions um, as soon as we can. So with that, I just, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. So if uh, you have not had a chance to see the school committee meeting or any of the presentations, that were have been presented over the last few months uh, we, we will show you our reopening website where all those materials are located uh, this is the plan um, that was uh, that has been adopted and the plan that we're we're working toward i would say that tonight when we go into questions if you would we just want to try to get to as many people as possible so if you could hold yourself to one question that would be great and if you could hold yourself to one question uh, and not uh, slip in some uh, little uh, other questions that are related like part A, B, and C, that would be great as well. So, uh, so the plan uh, as it stands right now and what we're moving toward is really essentially, if you think about just going back in a normal year, everyone is gonna be going to their um, home school. And of course, we're talking about the high school right now. So Braintree High School uh, will be open uh, for grades nine through 12. We will have, um, we are planning everything on six foot social uh, physical distancing. It is a hybrid model across the board. So pre-K through 12, uh, we have the hybrid plan is in place. It is two days in person learning. Uh, and those two days are half days. Uh, and then three days remote learning per week. We are looking and working hard to um, provide some expanded uh, in, in person learning opportunities for our special education students and those receiving specialized services. If you have a special education question, I would ask that um, you hold it uh, because we will be doing uh, a session next week that will uh, deal specifically with special education. Uh, we don't have our special education experts in the room right now. Um, we could probably answer some general questions around it, but again, we will be doing another Zoom meeting next week uh, by grade span likely and to focus specifically on special education. The, um, the in-person, I'm sorry, the remote learning plan uh, will be for synchronous and asynchronous. So when your student is in, uh, in the three days remote, um, not, not the in-person learning, but three days remote, we will be providing both synchronous, meaning live. Um, actually, I'm, I'm gonna let Mr. Lee speak to that, but as well as there'll be asynchronous opportunities as well. Uh, and everyone will be receiving daily schedules. Attendance will be in place, so we are gonna be having to report attendance to the Department of Education. Um, we will be taking attendance every single day and grading will also be in place. So for all intents and purposes, it is a regular year. At the high school level, uh, you'll have a schedule, there'll be transcripts to be produced, um, and it'll, it'll, from that standpoint, it'll operate like a, uh, like a regular year going in. We also have the parent choice for full remote option and we're calling it the BPS remote learning school, which we'll talk a little bit more about. We're still doing a lot of work on that, but um, that is an option for parents who are, do not want to send their child back right now, their student back right now, uh, that full remote learning option is available. We also will continue to offer our food service program, both grab and go lunches for when students are in person. So at the half day point, uh, they'll be able to get a grab and go lunch to go. Uh, and then for students who are in remote on those three days, they will also be able to take advantage of the grab and go meal service. 
we, this next one doesn't really apply to, uh, to you at the high school level. But uh, with that, I'm gonna uh, let Jim uh, take you through the next couple of slides here. Thank you, Dr. Hackett. Good evening, everybody. Uh, some just broad highlights about what the high school's uh, student schedule looks like. Uh, again, like all levels, we're looking to cohort students. Uh, and cohorted students would come to the school on either a Monday, Tuesday schedule or a Thursday, Friday schedule. Uh, in order to maximize synchronous time uh, in the afternoon, and you'll see it on the next slide, that the afternoon classes will be provided with, with synchronous activities, including Google Meets and so forth. Uh, this is the actual schedule. So if you take a look at it, uh, you can see that a cohort of students, who we'll, we're gonna call them the blue people, uh, are gonna come to school on Monday and Tuesday uh, mornings. And they're gonna go through those six periods of their classes on Monday and Tuesday while they are in person. And then in the afternoon, um, D, E, F on Monday are all synchronously supported classes. So teachers are available to students. Uh, students you know, can do things in real time with their, with their teachers on the Monday afternoon and every afternoon of the schedule. So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday afternoons, those classes would be synchronous. Uh, the second cohort, we'll call them the pink people, come to school on Thursday and Friday, and you can see they have those same six blocks that the blue people had on Monday and Tuesday as part of their in-person experience on Thursday and Friday. And similar to the, the blue group, their afternoon classes are also synchronous, and so that on uh, the first two days uh, or two days a week, they have all six of their periods synchronously. And on the days when they are not in school, uh, only their afternoon classes are synchronous. So we did this at the high school level to maximize the amount of time that kids are in synchronous environments. Uh, this, this is what we came up with. On Wednesday, you can see that although the academics may typically be asynchronous, there are a lot of synchronous activities going on, whether it be advisory or clubs, office hours with teachers, uh, you know, remote PE. So for some students, you know, if you look at an individual high school student's schedule, most of our, our students take five classes. So the sixth period in the schedule would be PE. That said, we also have students who have six academic classes before PE. And so on Wednesday, those students would receive their PE in a remote fashion uh, to satisfy that requirement. So all days of the week offer remote opportunity, um, offer synchronous opportunities. Uh, all afternoon classes in the, on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday uh, are synchronous in nature. Uh, and then the, the two in-person days cover all the classes that a student schedule holds, uh, possible exception being that PE that I mentioned. Is there another slide? I think that might be it. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, so uh, just to go back to this for a second, we are still working on scheduling. We are still working on transportation. We would love to be able to get to a place where we can transport students pre-K through 12. But right now, uh, our first goal is to make sure we meet the minimum state criteria, uh, which uh, requires us to transport students in grades uh, pre-K through a six. Uh, and it requires us to transport students who are more, two, more, two miles or more away from school. That, that is what we're actually right now making sure that we can meet, uh, that's our starting point. And we, we completely recognize that transportation uh, is, is, is critical. Um, we are still working on that. We wanna expand beyond just the state minimum. That work will continue. Uh, we should have a draft of at least the minimum requirement uh, by the end of next week for our internal review. And we continue to work on that. We have not yet, uh, we're getting the questions some about what day would I be coming in? Am I gonna be in person on Monday, Tuesday or in person on Thursday, Friday? We're still uh, also working on that. We recognize that that's an important decision for families as they try to plan their lives. Uh, Mr. Lee can speak a little bit about how we're thinking it, about it in terms of cohort, but um, we're, still, uh, obvious, we're still in process on, on, on that question. Mr. Lee, you wanna just kind of review that quickly? Certainly, and as, as mentioned, it obviously is a critical piece for families to know. Uh, initially, our, our thinking really relates to the alphabet uh, in making sure that we're trying to keep families together to the extent possible. Uh, we also understand that not everybody shares the same last name as everybody else in your house, so we have a student information system which would allow us to target addresses uh, as well as the, um, the alphabetical nature of the last name. So that is where we're currently thinking. Uh, however, we're also taking a look at more geographically, is there a way to bring neighborhoods in on the same days? Uh, we would look to coordinate this 
across all levels. Uh, and we would look to try to keep families regardless of what level their kids might be in. You know, we have families who have elementary age students and high school age students that we were able to get those families cohorted on the same uh, day combination. So that's our thinking. It is still a work in progress. Um, it, it obviously has certain challenges to it, but we'll continue to work on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. We are going to now uh, go to questions. And again, if you could keep to one question, please keep it, don't make it multiple parts so we can get through as many people as we can. We have about 180 five people on this call right now. So with that, uh, I'm gonna call on Claire Brady. Claire? Yeah, am I unmuted? <laughs> you are muted. This is your moment. I was a little worried about the technology. Me too. Well, me too. Okay. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Hackett. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I did submit a question, but um, and it did have multiple parts. But I will try to follow directions, and and ask the question broadly. So we've heard multiple times um, that we want to get students back into school because it's likely that we will have to close schools again. What are those conditions? that would require us to close school and how are you, how is Braintree Public Schools monitoring and managing for those conditions if we had to close school and how would schools be reopened again? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so, it, and it's a complicated question. We are, I don't know that we're, um, I haven't necessarily heard that we're looking to get kids back in because we may have to close. Um, our goal obviously is to, is to get students back in to uh, be as sustainable with that as we can. We cannot control, as we all know, the path of the virus. We can't control the numbers. Uh, the, the, um, the state has their way of uh, coding different locations um, uh, in terms of the, the uh, pace of the virus and the spread of the virus. Right now, Braintree is in a really good place. Our numbers are very good. Um, that could change, um, and we recognize that. Those decisions about closing school really come down to uh, the, our, our working with the Braintree Health Department. Uh, we would not make that decision on our own from the standpoint of, a, um, of, of health. Uh, if, the, if we had um, cases that were um, within the schools, uh, obviously, you know, with the, the protocols around um, um, sending kids, students and staff home and um, the, how soon they can come back and testing, it, do, it does get complicated. And, and it could be the case that, for example, that we have an outbreak in, in one school and not in another. And at some point, um, you know, for us, operationally, it becomes a question, can we, uh, can we, do we have so many people out that we can't staff? Uh, we would have to make adjustments with that. But for, uh, from the standpoint of actually making a determination about closing school, uh, that would come down to the Braintree Health Department. In terms of metrics, uh, you know, that conversation is, is ongoing. Uh, the state has come out with their own metrics, but obviously they're, they're looking at it from a little bit of a different angle. Um, and we would want to make sure that we are working with our own local metrics and local um, health department. And again, a lot of it's going to depend on how well we're able to manage the virus within schools. And that's our focus. We, we, we want to make sure that we do this in a way that is um, um, slow enough uh, and paced enough that we can sustain the opening and uh, that is really uh, one of the biggest reasons why we're looking at starting with, with a um, hybrid model with two days in person and three days remote and two of those days being half days. A biggest issue at the high school, one of the biggest issues at the high school and, uh, is uh, lunch. For, uh, um, when we feed students in a cafeteria, we generally have, if we're, we're fully in session, we generally have about 600 students per, uh, per, per seating. Uh, there's just no way to provide physical distancing in, in, uh, in that kind of environment. So we want to start with a half day and we'll do the grab and go service for students. We'll have some snacks, of course, uh, during the course of the day. Uh, we will be cohorting uh, and Mr. Lee can talk a little bit about that just since it's, much, it's more difficult at the high school level, but we will try to limit the uh, amount of student movement. And certainly, when it comes to the high school, unlike the other levels, uh, cohorting becomes very challenging. Uh, the, the programs that individual students take uh, tend to be very diverse compared to their, their peers. Uh, and so no two schedules, in essence, look alike. So 
you know, we've talked a little bit about the parameters we're looking at in terms of how to, to cohort students. We've taken some preliminary looks at what it would mean in terms of class sizes if we just strictly went by the alphabet and, you know, not, somewhat surprisingly, it almost splits 50-50 down the, the middle. Um, but that's work we need to continue to do. I mean, there's obviously also like passing time, uh, one-way corridors are gonna be essential, one-way staircases are gonna be essential. Uh, you know, the logistics of the high school just in terms of scale are, are much different than uh, the elementary and even the middle schools. Um, but it will, will, all that work is being done and we'll be in position by the time students arrive. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. I think he's muted. Frank, I believe you're muted. I am now unmuted. Um, <laughs> I did call Danielle in, but Jennifer, uh, you are up. Hi, I wanted to say thank you, first of all, for all of the hard work that you guys have been doing. Um, I know this isn't easy. And there's a lot of moving pieces that you have to consider. So thank you. We, thank you. Really, we really do appreciate it. Um, I love the, the graphics you've shared about what a hybrid student's day will look like. I was wondering if you could paint a picture for us of what the day for a fully remote student might look like. Thank you. So in terms of a fully remote student, uh, it looks very similar to a typical schedule because we're not trying to get bodies in and out of the building because we're not worried about a specific uh, six feet requirement between kids. Uh, the schedule can actually run in a much more normal fashion than for kids who are in the hybrid model. Now, with that being said, it is our intention to have all those courses staffed by Braintree teachers. Um, and we intend to have uh, courses that mimic the, the ones that are being taught in the hybrid model and having those teachers be able to coordinate uh, with teachers who are working with uh, the hybrid population. So uh, it, it involves less work. The, the Wednesday would look the same uh, in, in both the full remote option and the um, hybrid model. Uh, however, on the Monday, Tuesday and Thursday, Friday, it would just be a, a straight class schedule because we're not looking to finagle student bodies around. Thank you. Danielle, and now you're up. Danielle, we have you unmuted on our end. Yep, yes, there we go. Sorry, I accidentally raised my hand. I'm good. Oh, you're all set? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was the easiest question we've had yet. <laughs> all right, thank you're you. Welcome. Thanks. Samantha Everton. Hello. Hey. Hi, sorry about that. I think Mr. Lee might have touched on my question already, but one part of my question is, are you going to do your best effort to make it so that families go on the same day? Like if I had two, two children in the high school, would they be able to go on the same days? And part two of the question is when the kids are doing their schoolwork remotely, do they have to do it on that time frame, or can they do it at their leisure? Thank you for the question. We always try to make our best effort, Mr. Lee. So uh, the first question is, yes, we would make every effort to keep the families together on the cohorted days. Uh, it, it may not be possible in 100% of the circumstances, uh, but that will absolutely be our effort. Uh, the answer to the second question is, uh, it, if you recall what we talked about in terms of the high school schedule, the majority of the classes have synchronous components to them. And so the expectation would be that kids are available at those times to engage in the learning. Now with some of the asynchronous classes in the morning when a student is remote, uh, the teacher would make a determination about how completely asynchronous that work could be. If it was completely asynchronous, obviously a, a student could make the decision to do it at a time that was more suitable for them. Um, however, a, a lot of asynchronous activities involve collaborating with peers in, in real time using Google Documents, Google uh, Slides, things of that nature. So it would really be very dependent upon the activity the teacher assigned during those in uh, during the morning uh, remote day activities.
Hello? Hello? Hi. Uh, this is, the doctor is muted again. Go ahead, please. Um, hi, a question is, can we um, not choose, um, not in, you have not a Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, Friday? So can we allow to choose not a Monday, Tuesday? Thank you. So initially the school will cohort the students and tell you the days that we would like to have them. Um, you know, obviously we understand that individuals might have unique circumstances and we'll certainly communicate with families around it. But the uh, initial push will be for us to tell you the days we expect your children to come to school. Thank you. Patty Rust. Hey guys. Sorry. You got it. Okay. Uh, sorry, that Frank, was my fault. <laughs> I know. Frank, oh, listen. Quick, quick on the I'm, finger here. I can spend 20 minutes with you and help you with the Zoom. But anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anytime you want. Thanks, guys. Um, so question about the cohorts. So say, say my son's a pink person. Um, then on the blue days, I know there's asynchronous stuff for him, but is it, are they getting their full curriculum, if you know what I mean? Or will they be losing out on... Um, right, right now they're on what a seven day schedule and they have classes for six out of the seven days. So if you get my question, will they have six periods in a given seven day cycle or whatever the cycles are of, you know, physics or will there be fewer sections? I guess I'm, I'm confused about the synchronous and asynchronous. Thank you, Patty. The, the overall time will be uh, com comparable. I, you know, obviously there's some transportation issues that could affect minutes here this way or the other. But whether it doesn't matter whether your student is pink or blue, they both get the same overall experience in terms of time with physics and using your example. Uh, and the full course would be covered in terms of curriculum. Okay. Uh, Kate Drury. Hello? You gotcha. Hi, sorry. Um, so my question actually is more about whether or not, like how fluid is it if I make the decision to keep my son at home and do the fully remote option, do I have the option later on in the semester, in the year to move him into the hybrid or, you know, hopefully the completely back to school option? Or am I making the commitment for the year now? Okay. You Thank would you. not be making the commitment for the year. Uh, you would be agreeing to uh, identifying with us the logical transitional moment to bring your student back into in-person learning in some sort. So, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about when uh, that would be most appropriate for the high school. Uh, one school of thought says the, uh, the semester break would be the perfect place to do it. And it has a lot of benefits if you did it that way. Uh, as you mentioned, it really is a fluid situation. So we are considering other moments as well. But there would be identified transitional moments for students who were full remote to come back. Uh, and we would just wait until those moments came and transition your student back. Thank you. Kevin Pham. Yes, uh, my name is Kevin Pham. And I, before I ask, um, I would like to just say uh, thank you for everyone, you know, just uh, for gathering here together, just to uh, talk to each other about, and also reassuring each other about, you know, school and everything. Thank you. Um, so the first question I want, would want to ask, um, from what I've heard according to, according to uh, countless research, um, Zoom has been known for, for being very malicious in terms of, um, in terms of use of like uh, with um, how it can be used to, uh, um, how do you say, um, like uh, take people's like um, maybe uh, su uh, such and such. I think you know what, you, what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I do. Yep. So uh, if the question, we're not actually using Zoom, we're using Google Meet. So um, we, uh, we are Google Classroom school system. Uh, we've been impressed with Meet. Meet uh, has done a lot of upgrades with security. And I know, I know Zoom has done that as well. But uh, for us, that, the, the platform of Google and specifically Google Meet is what we will be using. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Teresa Sudek.
Teresa, you are um, unmuted on our end. There we go. I have two kids in the Braintree school system, one in third grade, which she's all set, and my son is going into 10th grade. He's autistic. His IAP calls for a bus. Will he get that bus this year? Yes. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye. Um, let's see here. Patrice Mack. Hi, gentlemen. Hey. Thank you. For, thank you for listening. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you. So, my question is: Are the tutorials from the teachers going to be via Zoom, so that the student has to be in front of their computer and the teacher has to see them and logs them in? In terms of, as you were talking about attendance, so maybe I should back up a little bit. How is attendance? going to be taken then at the classes via Zoom or webinars that the teachers have beforehand and then they just put out at certain times and the kids can do them in different times of the day. And my last question is, how are they created? Are they going to continue to be pass-fail or are they gonna, is there going to be a point system associated with them? And I'm sorry for so many like boom, boom, boom questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, we lost you a little bit. We'll do the best we can to answer uh, your questions. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Lee can speak to um, some of these uh, better than I can, but we are using Google Meet again. It's, we're not using Zoom. Uh, and uh, all the work will be graded. Uh, students at the high school will not be uh, marked pass or fail. They will get an actual grade, which will go on their transcript uh, in terms of the college application process that comes later. Uh, in terms of attendance, uh, again, the majority of the classes that are going to be uh, presented at the high school level are synchronous. So at the beginning of the period, the teachers would be um, taking attendance, uh, just like they would if the kids were in front of them in school. Whether uh, And obviously, if they're in school, that's how we take attendance. Uh, in terms of kids who are working uh, remotely in an asynchronous model, uh, teachers would either check in on the group at the beginning to make sure that they were all there or judge attendance by the submission of work completed during that time frame. Good afternoon. Sorry, you were muted. Sorry, I was Hello. muted again. I make more sense when I'm muted. Tuan? <laughs> yes, this is Tuan. How are you? Uh, thank you. Yes. Well, thank you. How are you? Great. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my question is on the hybrid model that we have uh, for the two days in school, um, are they full two days or they're half days and then half day remote? They are half days. Across the board, uh, pre-K through 12 in the hybrid model is two, two half days and three days remote. Got it. And then they have to come home when they lock in and do the work directly with the teacher in the synchronous model? That is correct, that is, I believe, Mr. Lee. Yeah, that, that, absolutely. What you said is exactly correct. Thank you. Uh, Diana Fitzgerald. Hi, how are you doing? Well, how are you? Hi, <laughs> good. Um, um, I had a quick question. Um, what if your child is in mixed levels? Um, how will that work? Are they staying in the same room? Like, how does that work? Because um, as far as like with other kids cohorting. It, it works by the schedule. So uh, your child can take different level courses at the high school, but an individual class is scheduled into an individual period. So if they have math, for instance, regardless, regardless of what level they're in, let's say that class meets A block. Well, that, that's where they're gonna be. So when they come in person, they're gonna go to that A block class and their next period could be a different level course, but it, that, that's a completely separate entity at the high school uh, compared to some of the other levels in our system. Thank you. Laura Kastner. Hi, hi. Um, hi. Thank, hi. Um, thank you guys for all of your hard work. Um, thank I you. Um, very quick question. It may be really silly, um, but I do have somebody who's in band and I was just kind of wondering, how are you handling, I saw how you were handling PE, how are you handling um, the other classes like band and art and things that are more hands-on? Are they going to have to pick another class? 
Um, Thank we're, you. We're going to be able to. No, the, the, the intention is that we're, they're going to follow the, the, the schedule. Those courses are part of the schedule that was shown earlier. Uh, so a, a, my last example was about a math course meeting A block. Um, band could meet uh, during D block, and that class would meet. What they would actually be doing is really dependent upon the activity. Uh, so there would be some instrumental options available to us. General music is certainly available. Some of our keyboarding, I'm sorry, uh, music keyboarding classes are available. Chorus is a little tricky uh, from the perspective that the state doesn't want those classes being taught in person. So uh, those, those courses will continue to be in the high school student schedule uh, and they would participate in them. Thank you. Um, Kim Hadley. Hi there. Kim. Um, I was, I'm planning to send my daughter full remote. I'm just wondering when we get the opportunity to let you know how many students or parents are planning to do that so that you guys can plan ahead. That will be next week in a survey. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, I'm gonna lower everyone's hands because of some people that still have the hands up that I've called on before. So I'm gonna lower them and then you can put your hand back up. All right, Carrie Coughlin. Carrie, you were unmuted on our end. Hi. Hi. I have a question about sports, and with the half days, are sports even a possibility? Mr. Lee, you want to take that one? Uh, well, the MIAA has just very recently came out with some uh, guidance on sports for the fall uh, to begin with. So I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, the, the student's day is not a half day. I, our student's day is a full day. It really is depending upon how much time is physically spent in school versus how much time is remote. So if uh, sports are available to us in the fall, uh, you know, students who were home in the afternoon would have to come back onto campus in some format because there's some guidance about how they can gather uh, for practices and things that, uh, like that, uh, which would be typical for a normal year as well. Thank you. Melinda O'Leary. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Good. So I just have a question regarding the grading. So I have a child who has who's on an IEP. And I, I think it's great that you're going to be doing grading because it is essential for high school students. But however, I'm just is there going to be any kind of leeway for the students if they fall behind due to the restricted in school time? Okay, hey, thank you. I, and I certainly don't know the details of your child's IEP. I, I mean, the, the team process is in place to address any type of, of concerns like that that would come up. Um, you know, obviously we work with individual cases annually, uh, pandemic or no pandemic. Uh, so I, I actually need more information to give you a better answer than that. Julian Kahn. Hi, thank you for uh, taking my call. Thank you. I just want to know if you will be screening kids for symptoms like every morning. Okay, thank you. So the protocols we have in place, uh, it, it begins with asking the families. Uh, we're going to give you a list of sim symptoms to look for every single morning. Uh, and in essence, you're agreeing that if you're going to send your kids that they're not exhibiting any of these symptoms. Once a student is on the bus or arrives to school, uh, if any symptoms are, are you know, apparent, uh, they would immediately be assessed by the nurse and decisions made about whether or not they could stay in school. Hey, thank you. Um, a Villa is how it's showing up on my screen. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Well, how are you? Well, thank you. I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about what the drop-off pickup and entering and exiting the building will look like, and if there would be an opportunity for a dry run prior to deciding yeah. hybrid or full remote option. Thank you. 
Uh, that is work we still need to do. Uh, in terms of a, a, a broad dry run, it, it, it really it is only valuable if we get everybody to do it, obviously. Um, you know, transportation issues, if, if we are able to provide transportation to high school students, uh, that might uh, precipitate us having a staggered uh, opening, if you will. Uh, we also have a number of different entrances at the high school that we could utilize to minimize interactions among students. We'll take a look at that. So uh, that's still a work in progress, and I can't give a much better answer than that one. Thank you. Sean McDevitt. Thank you. Uh, one quick question. For the afternoon sessions at the high school, which will have the students at home remote, what will be available for the teachers from a technology perspective with the students? Are they gonna be using Zoom or Google? So will those, will those blocks be treated as kind of regular classrooms, just remote with regular teaching via some technology platform? Yes, uh, it will be Google Meet though. Okay. Jim, do you have anything else you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I mean, and there's online, hi Sean. Uh, there's also online whiteboards, Jamboard is, is the, the application we would use. Uh, they would have cameras obviously, um, but the intent would be some level of synchronous instruction during that class period every afternoon. Thank you. Lori Hannigan. Hold on just a second, Lori, sorry. Whoop. <laughs> You have me muted. You're good to go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. I just wanted to stop by thanking you for all your work this summer. I know you've been working very hard on this. I appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to ask, I know right now most teachers in person would have after school help available for children or a lot of times have um, review sessions um, after school that kids can attend before um, tests. I saw on the schedule that Wednesday had some teacher time. Is that what that in, is intended to do or will teachers have after school online time available for students who need help? Thank you. So on Wednesday, those office hours are designed to meet that need that you described. Um, you know, there is some opportunity for uh, teachers during the, the Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, Friday. But as you can also see in that particular schedule, uh, their day is basically booked. Um, you know, there, there's a lunch period for them and some prep time that they deserve. Uh, so it would really, at that point, very similar to extra help now, but be somewhat dependent upon the individual teacher in terms of how they'd like to deliver that outside of school hours. Kate Joyce. So thank you, uh, <laughs> Dr. Hackett and Mr. Lee. My question relates to when we survey and get the results of those that want to go full remote and those that are going to do in person, is there any chance that the schedule be expanded if it was like a half and half scenario? I'm not sure I type. Can you ask the question again, please? I'm sorry. Sure. So there seems to be there's a group of folks that want to go 100% remote. Okay. But I don't know that we know those numbers yet. So no, we do not. Once that's surveyed, is there a chance that the schedule itself would be expanded for the in-person? Uh, not, not to begin with. Um, expanding the schedule for in-person uh, will really come down more to um, how, we're, how we're managing the virus within the building and what the, what the data looks like um, as we go through the fall. Um, I, I think if your question is, it gives us more room within the building, um, we would, we've already had six feet of uh, physical distancing, which we can handle. So uh, it would, that would not really uh, provide us an opportunity to uh, extend the day. Thank you. Kate Joyce. I think that was Kate. Oh, that was? Okay, all right, sorry. Um, and again, I've got some people here I think I've already called on before, but uh, Vanya, good afternoon.
Benya, you are unmuted on our end. Okay, um, can't seem to pick her up. Uh, Karen Lopes. Hi, Karen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Hi. Hi, thank you, um, you guys, for everything. My question is, um, do you have an idea of when the kids schedules will be out and I'm not sure if someone else had asked if a child is has to be quarantined will they have a chance to do remote learning the days that they would have been in school thank you so the part of the quick answer is that they obviously depending upon how they're feeling um, if they're ill and need to recover, that that's, should be the focus. But if, if they're just being quarantined and they don't have any symptoms, they can certainly access all the remote uh, elements of the program. Um, they, they, we would need to do some work with the teacher to provide some work, whether it be asynchronous or synchronous during the times that they would have been in school. Uh, but that student would still have access to the overall curriculum uh, and opportunities through all the remote uh, classes. I'm sorry, the synchronous classes being taught throughout the course of the week. Hey, thank you. Christine Michella. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, all right. My question is, what will the uh, synchronous versus non-synchronous learning be for the remote? Will it be equivalent to if I did the hybrid or more synchronous or less or? Thank you. I, I think it'd be comparable uh, is, I, I, and I'm sorry, this is the third of these meetings. I forget what I say in some of them, but uh, you know, there's research that indicates that three and a half hours for a high school age kid is, is an, enough synchronous instruction. So um, the opportunity for synchronous instruction in the full remote plan would, be, would actually be a little bit greater than the hybrid model. Uh, but whether or not a teacher decides to fully utilize that 100% of the time, um, you know, that, that would be their discretion. And in many, many cases, it wouldn't be desirable to do so. So there needs to be a balance between that synchronous and asynchronous work. Uh, that's kind of how all our lives work. Um, but the opportunity for that, that level of synchronicity is there. Thank you. I may need help uh, pronouncing your name, but Borislava. Hi, can you hear Hi. me? Yes, we can. Good evening. Thank you for um, picking me up for this question. I uh, just wanted to know, for the remote students, you said it is going to be very much a like normal schedule. What would be the start time? So we are still working on the, um, the transportation question. Um, you know, at the high school level, while we don't have to transport, as we've said, we want to be able to transport. So uh, once we know that, that may impact the start time at the high school. Sure. Um, so we are still a little bit of ways away from knowing exactly what the start time is going to be. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Jane Booley. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Okay. Um, I was wondering <laughs> if um, high school students are going to be able to meet with their guidance counselors in person, um, particularly with the college application process. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, the quick answer is yes. Uh, it would be obviously by appointment. There's some uh, logistics that we need to address in terms of keeping people six feet apart. If you've ever been in one of our guidance offices, uh, they're typically very small. Um, a lot of that work can also be done remotely and that will be an option as well. So it, it, is, it will truly be a combination of both um, as individual circumstances dictate. Thank you. May need help pronouncing your name, but uh, Vichelle? Hello. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my, I have a two part question. I think part of it may have been answered, but I just want to know that if somebody chooses the remote learning option, are they putting their kid at any kind of disadvantage over kids who are going to school? 
um, you know, in that in that like half days. So that's the first part. And second is, if for whatever reason a parent chooses to send the kid to school, but then they decide to make them fully remote or vice versa, is that an option? Okay, thank you for your question. So um, disadvantage is a strange term to use and, and I personally wouldn't use it. I, I think that the, the difference will be there. Um, in a full remote option at the high school level, uh, we will have, it is our intent to have Braintree teachers teaching those courses to the extent possible. Uh, if you think about the high school curriculum it is extremely diverse uh, and somebody who wants a full remote option, we might engage a third party vendor to provide curriculum content although facilitated by our own staff. I mean, some of those things have not been worked out because we don't know the individual students who uh, might choose that option and what their program could look like. So I, I don't see it as a disadvantage. We, we have kids who work through third-party vendors, you know, pre-pandemic, that's never been an issue for us. Uh, our staff facilitating the work will, will help ensure that it meets all our, our, our standards and to the extent possible, we wouldn't even use them, we would do it ourselves. So those are some unknowns in the remote option. So I, I, different perhaps is a better word, it didn't disadvantage. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. Uh, transferring back in and out. Uh, well, transferring out is, is certainly an option. Transferring in, uh, we would look, if your child was full remote, but wanted to come back into whatever hybrid or in-person model we were offering, we would look for some logical transitional moments to do that. Uh, an obvious example would be the semester break uh, because we don't want to disrupt your, your child's learning or the, the, the learning of students in the class. And we want to find those moments when a, kind of a new beginning comes around. Uh, semester is not the only time that those moments are available and we would explore uh, exactly what the most appropriate ones are. Uh, in terms of pulling out of school, if you were into the hybrid model, but you decided for the safety of your child, you wanted to go full remote, uh, that would be an easier transition, with, which we could um, do much faster. Thank you. Kathy Corbo. Hi, how are you? Well, how are you? Good. Thank you so much for all the hard work. I know there's no right or wrong answer for one <laughs> family or teacher. Um, and I know both my kids, my daughter heading off to college and my son are very, very different students. Um, that being said, I have a son that's going to be a freshman at uh, coming up at the high school, and I'm leaning towards the hybrid model. But it's just such a new big school with no teachers he's ever met before. And I'm just wondering if you have any plans to have the freshman maybe come a day before the other students just to get the lay of the land up there before they start uh, hybrid with everybody. Um, I just think it's just such a big place. It's all new. Um, yes. Before they're mixed in with hundreds of other kids, it would be nice for them to know even which way the rooms are and the stairs are in that piece. So that's thank it. You. No, thank you for your question. That's a great question. Uh, in, in fact, uh, just talked to uh, Principal uh, Dr. Scully today about that. Uh, as we get closer and we continue now, to, we know the model we're going into, what the options are. Uh, we're getting closer to schedules. We're getting closer to um, knowing the calendar, the school calendar. We know that we start in person with, um, or I'm sorry, we start instruction for all students on September 16th, but the discussion we had today, because that's a Wednesday, you know, can we find a way to think about the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday a little bit differently for, for that very purpose of um, an orientation, especially for freshmen who've never been in the building. We obviously have, we're gonna have new students in the same situation, but um, you know, not only freshmen going to high school, but also uh, fifth grade is going to East Middle School and sixth grade is going to, into uh, South Middle School. Um, we, we are, we're mindful of that. Um, and again, it's starting to get into those logistics and those questions now. So I would appreciate it. We know it's important. Stacy Doherty. Oh, I'm gonna unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you for your hard, your hard work and your time. Oh, thank, you. thank you. So the high school students, and I have a rising sophomore, they picked their classes for this upcoming school year. Are all of their classes going to be, they gonna remain the same, or is there any chance that the classes that they picked could be changed or not available for them based on any and all circumstances? Okay, thank you for your question. 
Uh, the intent would be to keep all the classes that they wanted on their schedule. Uh, to your point, uh, there are circumstances which could uh, lead to the elimination of a class or a, a, the inability of a student to access that particular course. We do have to reschedule to a certain extent, but our hope is that we can keep uh, everybody's schedule intact. Most high school schedules don't, um, don't have seven periods of classes on them. Typically one is, is a study. So, you know, when we drop down to six, typically we're not taking anything out to achieve that. Uh, so that is our hope and our intention. Uh, but you're right, there is a possibility that something could get dropped off. Thank you. Laura Burton. Um, okay. Second, Laura. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I just have a question about day one since it's a Wednesday for all students and that's Hi. like one of the remote days. Yep. So that came to my attention, attention today as I, uh, it was brought to my attention today. I hadn't even actually noticed it, um, uh, maybe a little bit overtired. So we're still working on that. Uh, we are obviously meeting with the, uh, the teachers uh, to figure out how this is all gonna go. Uh, but the calendar is still the question in, in that day. I just mentioned that, you know, that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday might be an opportunity at the high school level to do some orientation, uh, fifth grade level in the, into East and sixth graders to sell. So um, we have not yet set that yet, but that's a, that's a good question. And we are, we're, it's in conversation now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gabrielle? Hi, good evening. Thank you all. You do not sound like Gabrielle. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just had a quick question. Um, sure. And you may have answered this already. Um, so for the students attending high school, will there be transportation available to them? So we're working on the transportation right now. Um, our, our first step is to make sure that we meet the state uh, standards, the state expectation of the minimum of what we have to, tr of, of transportation that uh, we have to provide by law. Uh, one, once we are able to do that, high school is, uh, we do not have a legal requirement to transport high school students, um, but obviously we want to be able to. Uh, we are, we will be working uh, as we figure out how we meet the actual uh, state minimum and then trying to trying to expand from there. I mean, the the, the tough part is obviously we have uh, socially distanced on a, on a uh, 72 passenger bus comes out to be about 25 students. Um, so that obviously complicates things. But we are working on that uh, problem now. Thank you, Laura Menadou. Hi. Hi. Oh. Hello. Can you hear Hi. me? Yes. Hi. Okay. Thank you so much. My question has to do with the quality of the remote learning option and specifically the delivery of instruction. If I heard correctly, there are some things that are still unknown, but to make a determination regarding that option, when will those unknowns be known? Who will be delivering the instruction? Who will be, um, you know, overseeing the curriculum alignment? That's what my concern and question is. Okay, thank you for your question. So some of the answers that uh, need to uh, be received before we can state explicitly what we want to do. Uh, you know, there, as I mentioned earlier, there was a survey that went out to teachers this week. There's a survey coming out to families next week. Uh, that feedback uh, on both levels is essential for us to understand the resources that we have and, and how we will deliver the remote program. Uh, as I stated, we intend to have Braintree teachers that delivering instruction and facilitating the work. Uh, you know, one issue at the high school that exists that does not necessarily exist at the other levels is just the, the, the vastness of the overall curriculum that our program includes. And so there may be courses where we would get curriculum from a third party vendor, but again, it would be Braintree teachers uh, working with students on that curriculum. So those are, those are some of the unknowns currently, uh, but we are hopeful that by the end of next week, we'll be in a better position to give more concrete answers. Hey, thank you for your question. 
And Mr. Pham, for a second time, our last call in. All right. Um, hello? Yes, hi. Hello. Uh, thank you. Um, I do have um, way more. Uh, I have uh, several more questions if you're um, able to um, listen. I, I absolutely was able to listen. <laughs> okay, so my first question is um, is about uh, about like concerns about like uh, school clubs and um, and such and and I think um, we've I think you've already talked about sports, but I'll get to that in a moment. But as for as for clubs at all, um, will they be will they will they be implemented into into the school schedule? And if so, uh, will they work the same way? As last year, but with more precautions. And speaking of which, um, will uh, will clubs be excluded for for say a year or two, or how is it going to work? Okay, uh, good question. Uh, it's our, it is our intention to continue to offer clubs. Those are paid separately. Um, the the stipended positions they um, generally run after school. Although we do have some that run during the school day. We just aren't quite yet at that level of detail. Um, but it okay. is our intention to try to figure that out because we. We believe it's important for students. In fact, we have talked a little bit about whether we can start some of them a little bit early just to mm -hmm. reconnect kids to school. But again, we're not at that level of detail yet. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, so my next question here is, um, is something more about um, like mental stability and mental support for like, um, um, how would you say, for, uh, for students that are coming back from due to, you know, seven, I believe uh, six months of quarantine. How is that going to, how is that going to work? How are they going to be, medically treated and supported. Mr. Lee? Well, uh, internally, we understand that to be uh, not only a concern of, of families, but also of uh, the entire school system. Uh, mm -hmm. We've spent the summer sending people off to professional development around um, trauma and, and circumstances that we might experience when students return to our buildings. Uh, you know, school adjustment counselors, school psychologists, uh, building administrators are, are all prepared to, to help and, and provide support for those students that need it. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, uh, if you've seen some of the schedules, particularly at the other levels, we've also incorporated time during the day to deliver social emotional uh, activities to help, you know, support students as they transition back into our buildings. Uh, some, obviously, of the work, uh, we don't know exactly what we need yet because we haven't come in contact with the kids yet. And so having them back in our buildings being able to assess them, uh, see where they uh, where they stand and, and what kind of support that they need beyond what we've already prepared for will also be a, a critical part of what we do. Um, but it is something we have been preparing for uh, literally since March and uh, are ready for the school year to begin. Okay, yeah, that's good, thank you. Uh, right, thank so, you. <laughs> so my next question actually, sorry. Um, Mr. Pham, I'm gonna give you one more because we are at time, go ahead. All right, yeah, this is actually my final question, so thank you very okay, much. Okay, perfect. Um, I believe this is about um, I have book reports for uh, during during like the summer. How will they be uh, turned in, and will it be required for this for this year? And also, just another question too. Uh, and just uh, going back towards, <laughs> I'm so sorry. By the way, no, you're kind of you're kind of sneaky, Mr. Fam. Thank you. <laughs> by the way, uh, when we're like, if we can go back to uh, to sports, which I almost forgot. Thankfully, I. And I forget. Um, uh, what about um, esports for yet yeah, uh, for the esports team, or in other words, the game uh, game club? Because me and uh, Coach Troy, we talked about we we recently talked about like how like um, how games will be uh, you know will pass under the school policy and how like bringing in like um, how to say um, like written um, written forms will be uh, maybe will be required for like games that are rated T or rated M by the ESRB. Be ready. Uh, so we are absolutely not at that level of detail yet. Um, Mr. Okay. Lee, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I, I mean, obviously the esports teams are, are a club. Uh, you know, as Dr. Hackett mentioned, uh, we do intend to hold our clubs this, this year. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, about ramping them up for uh, how the, the school year will begin. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, beyond esports, sports in general, there's been some very recent guidance coming out of the MIAA that we're still, you know, working through to see exactly what the implications are. Um, you know, so we I go back to the original statement. Uh, we intend to run the clubs. Esports is one of those clubs, and we can look further into it as we go. 
Hey, everybody, we are at time. I just want to quickly show you, uh, we do have, if you're not familiar with it, we do have a reopening plan website dedicated to reopening. We are keeping this as up to date as we can. Um, you can see general information on here. Uh, when you go down a little bit more, that is the plan we're implementing right there. And then you can see uh, these icons that you can click on that are specific to different categories. We've also today added a feature for submission of questions. We are, you know, the questions are coming in quickly, so we are doing the best we can. But uh, if you click on this uh, button here to help us kind of categorize, you can submit your question, choose a category, so it'll go where we, uh, it'll go into a category which will just make it easier for us to sort. So the website address is uh, braintreeschools.org forward slash reopening. And you uh, all did a great job tonight. You kept the pace and I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. And again, we will hold a couple more sessions or at least uh, more uh, sessions devoted to things specifically like, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, special education um, and uh, some other areas that I know are of, of interest. So enjoy the evening. Thank you.